Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to Friday, day four, I think, of K-Fest. Uh, this morning we'll be having Ken Gagney presenting on WordPress for Dummies. Thanks, Ken. Welcome. Close, close, close. I'll be speaking about WordPress, which is a content management system that I've been using since December of 2006. I was running a variety of message boards on the online service known as Syndicom Online, which had a primary audience of Apple II users. That launched in May of 2001, and five and a half years later, it closed. It was primarily a text-based interface, and I wasn't sure what would take its place. I was using, I was using Syndicom Online to post movie reviews and book reviews. When the site shut down, I no longer had that outlet. And I found that as I watched movies and read books, I was still mentally composing these reviews, and there was no outlet for them. They had to go somewhere. So my friend Peter Watson, who used to read these reviews on Cinecom Online, said, why don't you reinvent what you've been doing as a blog? That's the modern medium of that age. I thought that's not a bad idea, because a blog is very similar to a message board, where you start a thread and then there are replies or comments. Mm -hmm. So I looked at several sites that I admired the design and functionality of. I asked the webmasters what content management system are you using. One person said movable type. Two people said WordPress. My hosting company at the time offered one-click install of WordPress. So that's the one I went with. So first of all, why use a content management system? Well, a good reason is because it separates the content from the design. I'll show you what I mean. This is my very first website. I <clears throat> launched it in 2001, and if I can get rid of the spinning beach ball, I'll scroll down to the very first post. Anyway. Actually, I also need to show you the source code. Okay, here we go. No, actually, let's do this. Here's the source code. And this is a page that I maintained for about seven or six years. And you can see that it's just me writing posts with little headlines to divide each new entry from the old one. It's one continuous HTML file. Anytime I want to update it, I would FTP into my account and edit that text file or that HTML file directly by just prepending the latest update to the top. As a result, you end up with a very long file of updates going back to, well, let's see, this one goes back to 2004, but there's, uh, I think if I click news, I'll get an archive. Um, anyway, the problem with this is that this is what the website looks like. And if I want to change what it looks like, then I need to go into the same page where I have all the content and make the changes there. So let's say that I want there to be an image at the top of every post to make it clearer where a new entry appears. I would have to go in and add that image to the top of every single entry. I could probably do a find and replace, but still it's laborious. Or let's say that I want to, um, you know, I have all these reviews here. Let's see if I can find these. This probably won't work. Oh, well. So here are all my reviews of Xbox games. <coughs> but reviews are different from news posts. <coughs> the news posts are dynamic. I'm always updating it with news up the top. The reviews <coughs> go into basically a, an index of reviews, and they stay there. They exist <coughs> outside the chronology. So what if I want to find all the news posts and all the reviews by Ken Gagney? Because there are several authors to this site. What if I want to find all the reviews of games by the publisher Konami? What if I want to find all the updates that I posted in May of 2007? There really isn't any metadata that exists to categorize all this content. It's just put in there as a straight text file. A content management system solves both these problems. It separates the design and the content, and it organizes it all. So let me show you what I mean. So this is the remodeled game bits. I launched this in December 1st, I think, of 2007. And it has all the exact same content that the old site does. All the old links still work. 
there are no floral floors as a result of this redesign. But now it's much more organized. I can find posts by Ken Gagne just by clicking on Ken Gagne. I can uh, go to a specific month, anywhere back to January of 2001 to June of 2012, and get just those specific posts. And then if I go to the bottom of any post, there's a list of keywords that categorize that post. So even though I have these categories here, Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64, et cetera, I can get even more granular. If I want to find every game or every mention of the word Metroid, I can just click that and get Metroid. And as I said, the design and the content are separate. So still, there's a lot of HTML involved. But I didn't handcraft all this. The, H, the design is basically a wrapper around the content. Now, if I go to this page, this is where I can choose the themes for my site. So let's say I'm just going to click 2011, which is the name of a theme. Hopefully, this will act quickly. I can click Save and Activate. I'm going to go back to this same page that I was just on, hit Refresh. Now it's completely different. Same exact content. There's everything I wrote. There's the videos, my categories over here, the keywords right there. But you can see that it looks completely different. And I didn't have to go into the HTML and rewrite anything. It's a very handy feature. For example, I'll show you one more. And let me actually put this back the way it was. <laughs> because this is all live. I don't have a sandbox or a development server. I, actually, I guess I do, but I'm not using it. So you may be familiar with see, my Apple II bits site, which looks like an Apple II. And this is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But I can uh, do a quick Google search here. This is what the site originally looked like when I launched it. It's designed to look like an old Macintosh with a bomb at the bottom and black and white and a fairly narrow content column. And I was able to change all that to look like this. So it's in color, it has Apple II icons, slightly wider column, and it has the dog cow, which still is a Mac thing, but I thought it was more user friendly than an explosive. And it, and conversely, I was able to make these changes without affecting the content. I was able to customize it and modify it and keep refreshing it and see how the stories I'd already written would flow into this new wrapper I designed. <coughs> so I use WordPress because, let's see. This is a list of sites that use content management systems. 54.1% of them use WordPress. The next most popular one is Joomla at 9.1. That's a huge gap. The gray bars represent all websites, not just those that use content management systems. So of all the sites on the internet, 16% use WordPress. That's huge. That's millions. And that means that there is a huge community around WordPress. There are thousands of people who use it, who develop it because it's open source and free. There is a plugin directory that allows you to add functionality to your site based on your specific needs. And there are currently 20,000 plugins in this directory. This directory only lists plugins that have been updated in the last two years. So as WordPress gets updated and new functionality becomes part of the core and compatibility issues arise, you can be sure that old plugins that have not been maintained will fade out and not be found in this database. So basically, if you have any problem with WordPress, chances are somebody else has encountered it and can fix it for you or with you. If you need a new feature installed, you can find a plugin for it. I have used WordPress for blogging, for static content, for podcasting, for e-commerce. I have not yet found a need which WordPress doesn't fill. So I really appreciate that flexibility and functionality.
Any questions so far? Have you been, uh, have you, do you use plugins plug yourself? Yes, I do. Let's see. Uh, well, my, I guess the main question was whether, uh, you say, that, have you ever gotten burned by a plugin? Like, you can go back and remove it from? Because yes. The Kansas Dust website updated to a new event calendar plugin just this about a month ago, actually. And usually, when you go to kansasdust.org, the homepage, events aren't listed there as part of the blog chronology. So I was using a plugin to hide the events from the homepage. It worked fine with our old event calendar plugin. The new event calendar plugin conflicted with the hide events from the homepage plugin and ended up hiding events from the entire site. And we could not find the events anywhere. And we didn't know what the problem was. Since the event calendar plugin was the newest element of the site, we assumed the issue was there. So we tried all these different configurations and MySQL queries. Peter helped a lot. And eventually we decided, let's disable every plugin except the event calendar. And we tried that. And all of a sudden, it worked fine. So we started reactivating the other plugins half a dozen at a time until the issue reappeared and we nailed it down to the hide events plugin. So we just went and found a different plugin that did the same thing because there are usually several plugins with similar functionality and we switched. Uh, there are other issues like I think Google, oh when I installed a new e-commerce plugin for Juice GS, uh, one thing you want to have and I'll go over this more later is a sitemap that you can submit to Google. It helps with their indexing, kind of looks like that. The products that were in the JuiceJS store with the new plugin weren't showing up on the sitemap. So I went to the website of the developer of the plugin that creates this, and he had an update that added products. So it was still in beta, but I installed it and it worked fine. I didn't, I didn't install it on any of my other sites because they didn't have products installed. Right? Uh, Sometimes I read about uh, hacks on WordPress sites where they've been infiltrated <coughs> and there are problems and they have to be patched. So uh, how do you patch the site? Can you set it up so it's automatic so it's always downloading the latest security updates or do you have to manually pay attention to that and update, update it? A little bit of both. Depends on how you installed it in the first place. Okay. But yes, WordPress can get hacked just like any other piece of software on the internet. You want to always have the latest version of WordPress, your plugins, and your themes. Keep those regular. I check daily to see if there are new versions of any of those. My own sites got hacked about a month ago, or at least a month ago is when I realized that they've been hacked. And I installed a variety of security patches after that, or plugins that specifically address security issues. I cleared out a lot of mysterious files that had appeared on my sites. Unfortunately, to this day, I don't know what the original vulnerability was that allowed this hack to occur. So it's possible I didn't actually address it. And if I missed any of the mysterious files that appeared, if even one of them is still there, then that can be their portal to hack my site again, no matter how many patches I've installed since then. Is there any way you can, do they have a tool to scan your site and see them? Yes. And that's how I found a lot of these vulnerabilities in the first place. Okay. Uh, in my case, 36 files have been uploaded across 12 sites, all with different file names, all with the same content. So I was able to just do a string search for that content anywhere on my site in any file. And then I removed all the matches. But that again, that only looks for files with content I'm familiar with and I'm actively searching for. There could be another vulnerability up there. <coughs> But on the whole, WordPress is pretty secure, and that's the first time I've had a problem like that in six years across 18 installations of WordPress that I use. <coughs> Installing WordPress is actually pretty darn easy, depending on your hosting company. I use DreamHost. Some Apple II, a lot of Apple II users rely on DreamHost. Some actively dislike it. I know both Eric Shepard and Jason Scott have had issues with DreamHost, and I'm sure they're uh, legitimate, it's just that their interactions were different, their experiences were different. I have not had those issues. But to install WordPress on DreamHost, I just go to my administration panel where I manage all my domains, my registrations, etc. And I click 
WordPress. And I get to choose an easy installation or a custom installation. I like the custom because the easy installation installs about 50 plugins and 50 themes that I don't want or need. And then if I do that installation, I then have to go in and remove all those files. So that's a lot of work. I usually am more familiar with what I want. If you don't know what you want, you can install the easy one and take a look at the 50 themes that get installed, find one that you like. It's probably easier just to go to the WordPress theme repository and see what's there, find one you like, and install just that one. So I'm going to go ahead and install this. I'm going to put it on peter-watson.net, which I have permission to do. Uh, WordPress requires a MySQL database. This will create it for me. Uh, the deluxe install is what I was telling you about. Includes a bunch of extras. And, uh, it lists some of the details there. But I'm not going to do that. So I'll just click install it for me now. And wait. That's it. It's done. Now, it says it'll take about 10 minutes to propagate. I don't know if that's true. Uh, that's the existing website of Peter Watson. I'm going to briefly launch my FTP <coughs> client and log into Peter Watson's site. Actually, I bet if I change my DNS to DreamHost, it would work right away. Let me try that. I don't usually give presentations that use the internet, just because I consider the internet unreliable. But a presentation like this is hard to do solely locally. I could install WordPress on this computer, but it already is installed. I don't know how to uninstall it and reinstall it. Bless you. I'm not going to install WordPress on a computer that isn't for, that I'm not responsible for. Bless you. Yeah, so no WordPress files have been installed yet on Peter's site. I try this. Probably won't work. Carrington, something you wish to share with the rest of the class? Ken's awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Carrington, you don't use a CMS, do you? I do. But not for one megahertz. No, not for two more years. How tantalizing. Well, I'm, I'm launching on Spreadsheets. I see. Uh, but to go back to the question about updating. Oops. That's not where I want to be. Further. Uh, once you use the one-click installer on DreamHost to install an app, then it gets added to your list of apps that you've installed. And you can then go to Upgrade Apps, and it will list all the apps that you've installed, check to see if there's a new version. And if you want to upgrade it, you can click Upgrade right there. You can also set it to automatically install those updates as they become available. Or you can use neither of these features and just go to the WordPress administration dashboard and click Update there. So that might take a few minutes to get through. But what can I do in the meantime? Yeah. Yes. Because you're using DreamHost, and I know there's an alternate way to get WordPress up and running. Like the WordPress people offer a free version. <coughs> yep. There is a confusing distinction between WordPress.org and WordPress.com. WordPress.org is where you get the software and put it on any computer you want, such as your own computer, DreamHost, whatever. It's completely free, completely open source. WordPress.com is a hosting service run by the creators of WordPress. And that's where they will host WordPress for you and do all the updates, all the plugins, etc. And you don't have to worry about any of that. And that's also free. There are paid features, such as to remove ads or to have your own domain. But the base package is free. The downside to that is you don't get to install whatever themes or plugins you want. That's walled off. And that's how they make it so secure, because every single person on the site 
has the exact same options and features. You can still customize your site, but only using the options they make available to you. So if you don't want to have to deal with updates, or if your needs are pretty basic and you don't need to do a lot of customization, or you don't need to like modify the PHP or the HTML files, you can use WordPress.com. Lauren? One of the reasons I like to do my own HTML is that I have my entire site in a directory on my hard drive and backed up various other places. And if something went wrong with my site, I could just go in and delete everything and re-upload the entire thing without any worries. Is there any way to do WordPress locally so that you've got control of all the files? Well, this right here is the dashboard for WordPress running off my own computer. It's running on your own computer? Yes. And all the files are local? Yes. But this is not a clone of the sites that I have on the internet. It's just a sandbox environment in which I can play with new plugins, and if I like them, then could I'm you, loading could to my you site. At, at some point, just take all of that stuff and put it on the website and it works? Well, I mean, I, I mean just... well, like you, I keep local backups. Not as simple as just copying HTML stuff, let's put it that way. Some of the links are specific to where it is, in other words. Well, there's, there's a MySQL database, yeah. too. It's yeah, not all I mean, static files. I mean, I am, but some of the MySQL stuff is still a little mysterious to me about trying to clone it from one place to the other, yeah. and sometimes it's just something else that just doesn't quite work. Because in that MySQL database, there are some path names, Yeah. and that can change based on whether it's on your computer or on DreamHost's. Okay, so that, that would be a little bit of an issue. It could be confusing. Alex? I was going to say, you can always keep another instance somewhere else online as well. And here, uh, you can use the main name, name, name for all kinds of things you can do. Um, it, it's not so hard to keep another copy somewhere else. You can also put a virtual machine on your local machine. Then you can have all kinds of the exact same things. Then you can have the identical information if you want to about that. So it's definitely doable. Hey, hey Ken. Uh, you mentioned limitations at DreamHost.com with the sites you manage. Could they exist there, or are there limits that would prevent you from doing what you're doing? All my sites are on DreamHost. I'm sorry, I meant WordPress.com. None of my sites are on WordPress.com. I know, but I'm just wondering. <laughs> you mentioned limitations. I'm curious if your sites could exist within those limitations for WordPress.com, or if if you need have any beyond that, what what those needs are that you have. I could not run most of my sites on WordPress.com. Okay. This site, I already showed you I did a lot of customizing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to customize my theme to this extent on WordPress.com. The base theme, the black and white Macintosh theme that you saw, wouldn't be available in the first place for me to customize on oh. WordPress.com. Okay. That would not be one of the themes they offer. Themes have standards, and WordPress standards change over time. This basic design was created years ago. Probably around 2006. It does not use a lot of the most modern features that WordPress.com offers, so they would not support it. Same thing with this. If you know about the structure of WordPress themes and you look behind the scenes of this site, it's really bad. It's uh, in some ways very limiting, actually. But I like the look. So I'm, in this case, going more for aesthetic than functionality. But again, this is not something WordPress.com would offer. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, Andy, then Greg. Well, you mentioned when they do security updates, even the themes need to be updated. Yep. So literally an old theme could have holes in it, right? So you can't depend on it being secure. You could have what? Security holes in it? Yes. Uh, right now, this is a page showing every plugin and every theme I've installed over all 18 sites. And I can see three of the plugins have been updated since I last looked. and <coughs> Three of the themes have been updated. And so what I would need to do is just click select all, update plugins. That's it. Greg? Are there some themes work better with mobile devices as opposed to desktop computers, or are they set up to work with all different kinds of devices? Great question. Which was, do some WordPress themes work better with mobile devices? Uh, there are themes that are what's called responsive, which is the new standard, which means that the site automatically reflows its content and structure based on the limitations of the browser. Uh, I'll give you 
an example of a responsive site. This is the gentleman who designed KansasFest.org. You can see that it's just a single page, actually. There are no <coughs> links within the site to other pages here. And it's just his portfolio, basically. But if I change my browser window, I thought it was responsive. Okay, that's not doing anything. Hmm. Let me try a different website. It did actually, when you made the window bigger, it got wider. They did have some expandability <coughs> let me uh, let's just let me do a responsive web example. Let's let me do that. Sixty examples of responsive <coughs> web design. Okay, let's see if this works. See that it went from two columns to one as the browser changed. And at no point am I getting a horizontal scroll bar at the bottom of the window. It keeps reflowing so that everything fits in what you see. So that is what's called responsive <coughs> web design. And that's usually pretty good for mobile. It doesn't change the content, it just changes what the page is reaching? Correct. Yeah. And that's again a feature of content management systems. Design and content are separate. For the responsive web design, it might change the content in that it will remove images. Like there might be a headshot of the author next to the byline. As the window gets smaller, it might remove that headshot so that it can fit the byline and the story. Here's a very simple website that I run. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is change my user agent to iPhone. And this should look different. And now it looks different. And that's because I install a plugin that lets me decide what content will be available to mobile devices versus desktop devices. Now, more and more mobile devices are becoming capable of viewing the desktop versions of websites. They don't need these stripped down versions specifically for cell phones. That's why I like to have the option down here, it says mobile theme, on or off, and a person on an iPhone or iPad or iPod can just click that, and it now loads the desktop version. Now, if I were to use my, set my user agent to a mobile device and go to cancelstuff.org, I would get the desktop version by default with a link on the bottom to turn on the mobile view. That's a different default I set for cancelstuff.org compared to this one. So this one, access it with mobile device, get the mobile site. Kansas Fest, access it with mobile device, get the desktop site. In both sites, you get the option to switch to the other. Uh, just different needs for different audiences. Well, it's handy if you've got the link on there, you can go switch from one to the other. Yes, and I wanted, <clears throat> I'm always wanting to give users options. Uh, hold on a sec. Let me uh, switch this key. There it is. Can you share a list of the plugins that you found useful? I'm actually writing that article for computerworld.com as we speak. Well, not as we speak, but. <laughs> yeah. Man, what a multitasker. Yeah, right. So, this is uh, until Peter Watson's site catches up with the installation I put there, which it hasn't yet. I'll just briefly go through some of the back end of WordPress and show you what that looks like. And maybe then we can backpack and I'll actually show you what the first installation steps look like. But anyway, when you first install WordPress and go to the dashboard, uh, this is what you see. There is a list of menu options on the left. And this is basically your dashboard that gives you some basic statistics about your site. There are a lot of commands in WordPress, and it can be kind of confusing to navigate them all. Fortunately, very few of them are destructive. So you can go around and click. Uh, each of these expands, as you can see. And the first thing you'll probably want to do is just go to settings and go to general settings. Uh, this is where you define the name of your site. So let's call it 
can discuss all nighters. And what's our site about? Insomniacs are us. <laughs> and then you pretty much don't change the domain of your site. Your email address, if the site needs to contact you for any reason, this is where it'll do it. Uh, membership, can anyone register for your site? Generally, you don't want to let them register because there's no benefit to them doing so unless you're running a blog network where you want them to have their own blogs, but that's a whole different follow game. How you want the dates to display, how you want the time to display, click save changes. That's your most basic setup for WordPress. There are a lot of other settings. Um, let's see, none of these are important. Your front page, do you want it to always be your latest post with the newest one at the top? Or do you want it to be like that other site I showed you, which is, this, there is no blog component at all to this site. This is all static content. Every time people come to this site, they get this home page, at least until I change it. But it's only one piece of content. Usually it's advertising their next show, because this is a community theater. You can put in JavaScript. Uh, you probably can, but that might require a plugin. Okay. It might disable JavaScript by default due to security issues. Okay. Same with PHP. Uh, discussion is an important one. Do you want people to be able to respond to the content you put on your site by leaving comments right on your site? Most blogs have this feature enabled. So at the bottom of the post, you might see 147 comments, 10 comments, zero comments. This is a great way to engage with your audience and get them coming back because it establishes interaction not only between you and your readers, but between the readers themselves because they start responding to each other. However, there are a lot of downsides to doing this. One, it takes up a lot more time and resources, especially on the part of the website master or the webmaster, because now you have to be reading all these comments. And secondly, Spam. Spam is no longer something you just get in email. Spam is something that you find on your website, in the comments, all the time. There is a very good spam plugin that usually gets installed by default with WordPress because the guys who invented WordPress invented this plugin, and it's really good. It's called Akismet, and it is very good at capturing spam in article comments. But it's not perfect. <clears throat> You'll want to review your spam folder to make sure it didn't accidentally tag something as spam that isn't, and you'll probably need to remove some comments that are spam from your site anyway. So it's a lot of work, but usually it's worth it. Uh, privacy, do you, want site, do you want your site to be visible via Google, Yahoo, Bing, Alta Vista, whatever? Uh, this is a very simple yes or no. Usually just click yes and then forget about it. If you're running a private site or your site is still in development, just leave it to no, which is usually the default. And permalinks. I once told somebody, I was looking over their, their shoulder on a computer, I said, click the permalink on this site. And she said, is that going to permanently add it to my list of bookmarks in my browser so I can't delete it? I said, no. Permalink means that's permanently where you can find that piece of content on the web with a lot of Sites, like if you see the question, a question mark or an ampersand in the URL, or if you're searching for a product on Amazon, those URLs aren't always static. Those can change. A permalink ideally does not. So let me give you an example of a permalink. Uh, here's a blog post I just put up two days ago. It's a YouTube video showing a fight between Batman and Captain America. And if you click on the headline, you get to the page specifically for that piece of content. And the URL is showbits.net, which is my domain, followed by the year, the month, the day, and then what's called the slug. And that is just basically a small uh, string that I use to identify that. This could have been anything. In this case, the headline and the slug are the same, Batman versus Captain America. I could have put anything else with the slug, like BVSCA as some sort of abbreviation. Or you could have just numbered them. That's right. Well, Karen I have a question. Yes. Here's something I don't know about WordPress. So, uh, the slug, I think, is generated from the title of the, the post. Is that correct? Yes. So does the slug change? It can change the title after it's published. No. So it won't break links. Correct. You can okay. change it if you want. Yeah, but I think it doesn't yeah. automatically. Right. Okay. So, cool. Yeah, well, so I, that's one of your automatic well, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, let's see. I'll go to post, add new post, and I'll say 
Carrington's question is in my post. Carrington would like to know more about this topic, but he's beyond help. <laughs> and I'll click publish. And now if I go to my website, there's my new post right at the top. Now you can see that the URL right now is simply the domain of the site, which in this case is localhost colon 8888. But if I click on the headline, Carrington's question, now I get a permalink specifically to that piece of content. And what Carrington was asking is, the slug is Carrington's question. But when I was writing it, and even before I published it, I could click edit right here and click and type in anything else. Beyond help. And I'm going to click update. And now if I go back to this post, which I previously loaded with the permalink, perma link, and click refresh, it redirects. So it is a permalink because it realized that there was a change, and now it's sending me to the new address, which is beyond help. And again, if I were to go here and change this to uh, the Canadian's question, and then I go over here and click refresh, the headline down here changed, but the slug did not. It's still beyond help. So those, when you first start a post, the slug is generated from the headline, but you can then alter either or both before it gets published or after. So they're not necessarily dependent. Any other questions at this time? Cool. Um, you know, one, one clarification, you could host WordPress content on your own ISP if you wish. It doesn't have to be on WordPress or no specific site. Is that correct? That is correct. You can go, you can host it on WordPress.com, as I was saying, and they'll run the software for you, or you can put it on WordPress.org. You can grab the software yourself from WordPress.org and put it anywhere you want. So uh, DreamHost or Lunar Pages or... Uh, site 5 or your own computer, anywhere you want. Did you, uh, you address this question before I got it? Does this generate any HTML code? Oh, yes. Yes. So it's, it generates standard HTML. So it's transferable. <coughs> well, one of the things about WordPress is that every time you go to a WordPress site, it's not loading what's called static HTML files. The content you're looking for is not already sitting there as an HTML file waiting to be served up. Uh, it's all dynamically generated. So there is a kind of database called a MySQL database, M-Y-S-Q-L, and all the content and all the settings and all the preferences and posts and pages are all stored in that MySQL database. And when you go to one of these permalinks, there is a whole bunch of uh, code in the language PHP that WordPress runs and says, okay, they're asking, the person coming to the site is asking for this content. Let's go into the database and find the content that matches that request, and then we'll grab the theme that the webmaster has chosen, wrap the content around the theme, put it up on the website where everybody can see it. So, so there's a delay there, and that takes time to do, which is why you may want to install what's called a caching plugin. A caching plugin determines what are the most common requests for content that people have, and then it pre-generates that content and wraps it around the theme and makes it available much more quickly than having to go to the database every single time. So you won't see the source in the same way as you can. When you're looking at a, data, a website, you go down the source and it's... Right. So like on this page for the Canadian's question, I click the source code and this is all HTML. But it's generated uniquely at each each time depending on the circumstances. Exactly. And I'll show you. And it's generated differently depending on different circumstances. <clears throat> it's like a macro expansion in that respect. Right. Um, here is the code that generated the Canadian's question. It's all PHP. Mm -hmm. It's basically saying uh, take the ID of the Canadian's question, go into the database and grab the content that matches that ID. Wrap it around this template. If there are comments, grab the template for the comments. Uh, put the footer there, put the header here, and it's doing that every single time. Okay, so it'll give you different, different, uh, different 
HTML code depending on circumstances. Right. Uh, but it seems to me, although I don't know PHP, PHP, MySQL are not, they're not, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's like, like Microsoft is owned by a company. It's not, uh, it's not open source. Right? It's not proprietary. It's open source. So there's nothing about this that's proprietary. I, so you can move it anywhere. Correct. And also, I can modify this PHP code. Uh -huh. And then I'm no longer running the WordPress that came to me in the package. So the reason I like I like uh, HTML editors, graphical editors that or, or text editors, is because you get HTML which is industry standard. You move it anywhere. Oh, this is not quite that. It shares that characteristic. It's industry standard, not proprietary. You can move it anywhere. Well, it's not. I mean, it does follow the standards for whatever the HTML standards are, yeah. but I mean, WordPress is doing its own thing. You know, it's not like they have to have these features in there. Yeah. So, uh, Greg. But it's transferable. So those, those of us who are lucky enough to still use Spectrum, what does the content look like using Spectrum? The question is, what does the content look like when viewed in Spectrum? And I think, well, to be honest, I haven't tried that. What I have tried is links, the text-based web browser. Which, which one? L-I-N-X? L-Y-N-X, not oh, L-I-N-K-S. Okay. Uh, this is a program that's available to Apple II users who have shell access, such as Fox Valley. And this is my GameBits website. And there's some stuff there that doesn't really make a lot of sense, like invader.gif or WP Greek Fox icon. But generally, the, co the text is legible. You can read that. You can't view the YouTube videos, obviously, nor would you be able to on Spectrum. But yeah, this is uh, pretty legible. Uh, two quick terms that you need to know if you're going to use WordPress. The difference between a post and a page. And I'll go to Gambit's list. This is the homepage of Gambit's.net. Sci-fi and fantasy books that should be games. Wreck-It Ralph movie trailer. Rift Tracks does Final Fantasy. Rolling High Chronicles first time D&D gamers. Each one of these is what's known as a post. It exists in the chronology of the website, newest one is always at the top, and it has a date that shows you when it got published. These are called posts. A page exists outside the chronology. It is static content. It doesn't scroll down. It's always there. In this case, my pages are about game bits. You click on that, and you get a description of the site and all its authors. Click on Contact Us. You get Here's a form to fill out to email me. And these are stored differently in the database of WordPress. So you have posts, add new post, and then down here you have pages, add new pages. So those are different. You can have different headers and footers on each one. Uh, they have some different, a few slightly different rules. For the most part, designing them is the same, putting content is the same, but when people talk about posts versus pages, that's what they're talking about. Let me backtrack a bit and talk a little bit more about permalinks. Uh, my permalink was the website name followed by the year, month, day, and the slug. You can change that. It can just be the website domain name followed by the ID number of the site. Uh, that's not very legible, not very user friendly, doesn't give you a lot of information, but you can change that. Um, let me. See, I also want to go over some external tools that webmasters will want to know about. But before I do that, any other questions about WordPress? Uh, Mark. I have a question on getting the data out. Can you, um, let's say you built a blog with uh, tips on how to use that to do that. you have one of them, if you want to take all that content and put it in the format. Is there a plugin or a feature like that to work? Yeah, you can export right here. You can choose specifically which post you want, specifically which pages, or you can just click all content, and it comes out in an XML file. And then what you do with that is up to you. The designers of WordPress operate with the philosophy that the easier they make it for you to leave, the more likely you are to stay. So they make it very easy to get your content out, get your content in, etc. And just a follow-up question, is there a
There is, but the name of it escapes me at the moment. Under privacy, do you think that also would affect inclusion, would you say, like wave definition? I think there is a robots.txt file associated with this. I'm not sure though. Maybe. Uh, is there a good website that reviews WordPress plugins and themes? Oh, there's WP Nuggets. Okay, that's one. I'm sure there's a lot out there. That's the one I need. I'm looking at it. Not besides that, just looking at the WordPress site, looking at the stars, and getting feedback out of the forum. Let's see. Should you have a way for the keyboard there for a while? Yes, I was AFK. Another thing I want to show you is widgets. I'll pull up the Kansas Fest website for that. Now, on the Kansas Fest website, along what's called the nav bar, which in this case is vertical on the left side of the screen, you have a bunch of different sections, basically. You have uh, the different menus that are available or the different pages that you can use to navigate around the site. You have all of these different buttons that show where Kansas Fest exists elsewhere on the internet. You have a search bar, and you have the poll for what movie we should see. Uh, which I haven't voted on actually yet. On the left. Saturday night. So there. Now each of those four sections is called a widget. And those are all defined right here. We have the jQuery accordion menu, which is a fancy name for this section right here. We have the subscribe. We have uh, text, which is the search form in this case. And we have the form or the poll. And this is just some blank space right there. And I can rearrange those, just drag and drop. I can remove them entirely if I wanted to. I can add new ones. Like let's add the cafe press widget. And I'll just scroll down and click save. Oops. And now let's go back to the site and refresh. See, now the, uh, the the navigation thing is at the bottom now, because I dragged and dropped it to the bottom. There is a list of all the different Kansas Best products you can buy from our Cafe Press store, theoretically. That doesn't look like Kansas Best, but whatever. It looks more like Pugs. Mark uh, Obama, yeah, that's not us. But this is how easy it is to change the content on your site. It's uh, not something you could do with an Apple II, unfortunately. But you can just uh, add, subtract, drag and drop, pretty much anything you want. These are all the options for the widgets I have available right now. And you can add more. Different plugins have different widgets. Uh, just recently, I removed the countdown widget, which used to say three months and 10 days until Kansas Fest 2012. Now, for the last week, it's been saying zero days until Kansas Fest 2012. And that wasn't very informative, so I just removed it. And as soon as we have the dates for 2013, I'll add it back and update the day it's counting down to. Yes, it's going on now. But we want people to be at the event, not on our website. Oh, you can't send the session. I'm refreshing. And then, like I said, there are a bunch of different plugins you can install. If you go to our Twitter stream, uh, this is a plugin. I gave it a list of all your Twitter user names and the hashtag, and it automatically streams everything with that that matches that content onto this page. Uh, there is our event calendar, which is a plugin, and it presents it as a calendar, or it can, uh, right there. And if you mouse over it, you get a the date, time, and description of the event. If you go back here, you can, you can click on the name of an organizer or a venue and get all the sessions that are being given by that person or in that place, which would be very handy. Uh, some very basic plugins that I recommend include a Kismet, which I mentioned earlier, and Jetpack is one that's also created by the people who create WordPress, and it actually sort of a hodgepodge. It has 12 different functions, none of which are necessarily related. You use Jetpack to install a contact form on your website. 
You also use it to express complex mathematical formula on your website. Not very related. But you can turn those individual functions on and off. And I don't have too much time left, but I want to briefly mention that there are a lot of external services that can help you run your WordPress site. Uh, Google Analytics is a very common one and a very important one because it tells you how popular your site is. Not just which pages on your site are being read, but where people are coming from. Are they clicking a link from somewhere else that then goes to your site? Are they doing a Google search to find your site? If so, what keywords are they searching for that lead you to your site? Where does your website rank? What words is it associated with in Google? And the way you do this is you go to Google Analytics, give them your domain name, and they give you a little piece of code. And they say, add this code to every single page on your site, and we will track it. Well, you don't have to do that. This is WordPress. There is a Google Analytics plugin. It will ask you, what's the code that Google gave you? Tell me, I'll put it on everywhere on your site for you. You just do it once, and then all this information gets tracked. Downside, it's being tracked by Google. If you don't want them to have that information, don't use Google Analytics. But you can really break it down quite a bit. You can see what browsers they're using, what operating systems they're using, uh, what mobile devices, how long they stay on your site, if they've been to your site before, where they went after they left your site, very important. So are those statistics real-time? No. Is it or is it like daily? It's usually like a, maybe a day behind. Okay. There's another service called Chartbeat, which is at that moment. I don't use that, It's but a lot of newsrooms do because they're very much cutting edge. And briefly related to uh, Google Analytics is something called Search Engine Optimization, or SEO. I could give a whole presentation on that. I'm already a minute over, so I'll talk about it only briefly. Search Engine Optimization means creating a website that makes it easy for people to find it using a search engine. So for example, um, you know, Carrington had a question, and what was your question again earlier? Oh, about the slug? Yes. Right. right. So if somebody was wanting to find out if the slug and the headline on a WordPress post were associated, what sorts of words would they do a Google search for? No, really. Anything? Slug, post, WordPress. WordPress. Right. Those are the kind of words people would find. If they did a search on those words, would they find this post? No. Because the headline is the Canadian's question. And people don't do people with questions about slugs and permalinks aren't searching on Canadian questions. So there is a gap there. You want to uh, Google prioritizes the names of sites and the headlines on posts. So you want to create headlines and site names that are descriptive. Sometimes people are concerned that that means it's uncreative or unimaginative and that you're writing for a search engine instead of a person. Well, there's a way around that. In this case, I would say the Canadian's question, colon, are permalinks and slugs in WordPress associated. So by doing that, I get those key words into a place that Google prioritizes, and I'm opening with something that could be witty or zingy. It's kind of like when you're writing a, a thesis in school. You know, there's always a colon in there. You know, there's a, a snappy name to begin with, and then a really long description. Um, same thing with headlines. Uh, this is a website I run. And for a while there, the name was simply MS Challenge Blog. Okay, that's a little descriptive. But then I added the, cult, the, uh, the hyphen after it. Walking Cape Cod, Massachusetts for a cure for multiple sclerosis. Lots of keywords there, very dense, very rich. People doing a search for multiple sclerosis, Cape Cod. There it is. It's number four. Nope, that's not it. There it is. It's on the first page of Google. Most people don't go past the first page. So the fact that I'm number 10 out of almost 7 million is largely due to the keywords I put in the title. Uh, 
if you do, uh, I search for multiple sclerosis Cape Cod. If you do a search for Apple II Forever, Kansas Fest is right there. Because for a while, its tagline is said Kansas Fest, Apple II Forever. Then we change it to Kansas Fest, Apple II Convention, July, Kansas City, Missouri. Because if you do a search on Google on Apple II Convention, you get Kansas Fest is first. And that's what you want. People trying to figure out where to meet other Apple II users are going to do a search on Apple II Convention. They're not going to search on Kansas Fest because they've never even heard of it. So how can they search for it? So you need to have something besides the title, or besides the name of the event, in your headline. Uh, also the same thing, actually, with even at the level of links. If you want to do, uh, let's say you want to add an image to something. You're going to do uh, image, source. You don't need to know HTML. There are <coughs> buttons to help you insert images. I'm just doing this quickly. If you want to do image source equals screenshot.jpg, you might say, uh, Actually, let's make that a link. And you might say, click here to see a screenshot. <clears throat> well, Google looks at the names of files and the words around the links. This is not very descriptive. People aren't going to do a search on screenshot. <clears throat> uh, so, you have to close the tab. I did. So, you might change this to. Uh, let's say you and just released Spectrum and you want to promote it and you're uploading a, a screenshot of Spectrum. So you might say spectrum.jpg. You might say, instead of click here, you might say, here's a screenshot of UN's telecom program. And you don't necessarily need to say click here because when you post it on your website, which I just did, it looks like a link. It's blue, it's underlined. When you mouse over it, you see that it's a link. That's pretty standard behavior on the web. So you don't need to say click here because people know how links work on the web. And you click there and, well, there is no spectrum.jpg, so it's an error. But, uh, but that's briefly how SEO works. If you want to write your posts offline, uh, for the Macintosh, there's an excellent program called Mars Edit. It interfaces with WordPress and a lot of other content management systems. I have a lot of different sites, and I have WordPress configured for all of them. Very often, I have an idea for a post, and I'll save it as a draft, and then come back to it later. The old way I used to do that was kind of like how I used to run my website back in the day. I just have one text file with a lot of different ideas with just a line of dashes in between them with the old one at the bottom. And I'd never get to them because I'd look at them like, that's a link that means nothing to me. There's no context. Uh, of course, I'd never get to the bottom of the list. But now I have a nice folder called Drafts. And it shows me what website I am drafting it for, the title, the category that I put it under. And there's really not much in the way of content right now. But you know, this is something that I started for the Juice Guest website. I'm going to do a blog post about the interactive fiction competition. And this is a link to the site to enter it. And that immediately gives me some, uh, it jogs my memory to let me know what it was I was going to do. And then I can publish it anytime I want. And I can even see it previewed here, what it will look like when it goes on the Juice.js website. It's kind of cool. I don't actually need to upload it and preview it there. I can do it all locally. Which also means I can write my post when I'm offline. And then just click Submit when I'm ready. Tony. Um, what is your experience with things like next-gen gallery and plugins and slide in uh, functionality across the top and Mars edit and you'll find you have to pre-plot your stuff, leave little notes in the article where you want to put it and then go do that. The question is some plugins add functionality to your posts. Uh, for example, there's a feature in WordPress called a short code. So in this case, like I would be able to type in brackets gallery ID equals three. And when I put that on WordPress, it'll automatically replace that text with the third gallery in my database. It's very handy, but the plugin that turns this into a gallery doesn't exist in Mars Edit, which is running on my Mac. That plugin exists on WordPress, which is running on DreamHost. So is the preview available in Mars Edit a 100% representation of what I'll see when it's on my site? No. So in fact, in a way, this kind of adds a step. I usually write it in WordPress and then submit it to my WordPress. Uh, 
uh, yeah, right in Mars Edit, submitted as a draft to my WordPress site, an unpublished draft. Then I go into my WordPress dashboard and preview it there, because that's the actual environment in which it's going to get published. And I take a look at it there, and then correct anything that needs to be corrected, and then click publish, and then it's live on my site. I still like Mars Edit for its ability to categorize all my posts for all my sites in one place, but it's not a substitute for the WordPress dashboard. Uh, let me quickly take a look at the back chan. I know I'm running over, but I don't want to ignore any questions that were submitted there. Uh, is there a community where you can get help if you need it? Yes. It's called Kansas Fest. Uh, no, but really, I use the uh, WordPress.org support form, and the administrators there tend to prioritize posts that have zero replies. They have a way to filter for those, so if your message doesn't get a reply soon, they will try to reply to it. Unfortunately, despite that, I tend to not get a lot of replies there. Um, but there is also an Apple II email list for people who use WordPress and Apple IIs. Not that they necessarily need to be an intersection of the two, but if you are an Apple II user who uses WordPress and you want help, uh, there's an email list for that. Just contact me. The other question is, is plugin management someone like managing extensions in GSOS and macOS Classic? Can you clarify that, Steve? Well, you talked about something went wrong and so I just shut them all off and then start one by one by one by one by the problem. That sounds like that is familiar. conflict catcher and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's not something I've had to do in uh, OS X, but you didn't ask about that. GSOS and macOS Classic. Yeah, there is some overlap. A uh, nice thing about WordPress is when you disable a plugin, it gets added to a category called recently active. So <clears throat> if you have 30 active plugins and 30 inactive plugins on your site, and for 60 total, and you deactivate all 30 that you have active, you don't then need to go through a whole pile of 16 and remember which ones did I just have active and now need to reactivate. It separates them. So you can just go to the recently active category, click the checkbox for all, select all, and then click activate and bam, they're all back immediately. So it's very easy to test these things. When I first started using WordPress six years ago, upgrading and testing things like that were up there. Every time you install WordPress, you had to download WordPress, the newest version, disable all the plugins on your site, up, upload the new <coughs> version of WordPress, re-enable all your plugins, and you didn't know which ones those were because there was no recently active list. Now it's just a one-click update. You go into the WordPress dashboard, you click update to latest version, it does everything for you. It's very easy. I do recommend backing up WordPress, and that means both the static files that constitute the program itself and any images that you've uploaded, as well as the MySQL database, which has all your posts. And there are plugins to help you do that. There are commercial programs. There are commercial website services, like uh, Backup Buddy or WordPress Vault, I think might be two of them, or VaultPress. Uh, but there are usually some pretty affordable backup options out there. You just want to make sure that your backups work. Don't wait until your site crashes to try to upload your backup. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I could talk about this all day, but I'm already well over. So uh, with that, if anybody has any questions about WordPress, feel free to talk to me afterward. I am an enthusiast of WordPress. There are things about it I don't like, but I work around it because overall it's pretty flexible and it's a great way to run a website. I'm sorry. I that for some reason Peter Watson's site never became a WordPress site like I intended it to, but you basically saw the entire installation process. You didn't miss much. It's very easy to get up and running with WordPress. Thank you. Thank you.